We are back with another episode of your favorite podcast. I'm Jimmy, and this is the Wild Ones podcast, episode 37. We've got Francis, and we've got Emily in the room. I'm having a weird feeling of deja vu, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, why? Why was that? <laughs> oh, it might have been because Emily forgot to press record on one of the cameras, and we recorded 15 minutes of a podcast. That we're now re-recording? Yes. Yeah. We have our first fluff up of the week. But listen, I think we can do it better this time. I found it extremely boring the first time around. <laughs> I thought it was amazing. And you're going to release the audio only version of that 15 minutes on Patreon for the small price of a thousand pounds a week. Yeah, exactly. That's, that a, that's exclusive. That'll go up in value. It's like an NFT. Yeah, because they all went up in value loads, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. I don't understand what an NFT is. That might not be what it is. <laughs> Go on, so, Jimmy. Tell us what you've been doing. I've been on the road with pro bike mechanic Nick. Sorry. Uh, f- fair. <laughs> uh, we went to a massive industry trade show uh, called Core Bike, where they've got not everyone in the industry, because it's 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 a big chunk of it, but not everything. Uh, got to see some new stuff that's coming out that is embargoed and no one knows about. There's lots of signs saying no photos allowed. Uh, and I was like, can I take a photo? And naturally they said no. So I took naughty ones. <gasps> Um, there's some cool stuff coming out. Uh, the general feel, which I think might upset some people, it may not, is that everything is moving towards gravel. There was a bike brand, and I can't remember who it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fairly major bike brand. I was chatting with Tony about it the other day. and Tony being marketing manager for Scott, Scott Bikes. Scott UK. Um, and it's not Scott. But there's a there's a fairly major bike brand that have now sold their their, their gravel market is bigger than their road market. Yeah, they've sold more gravel bikes. But it's if you bonkers. think about it, a gravel bike is you know, gravel's a weird term for it. Really, it isn't actually a gravel bike. It's kind of more. It's a bike that's got probably more relaxed geometry, big tire clearance, and you can ride it on a road. You can ride it not on a road. So it is the it's the main step of one bike does everything kind of thing. Yeah, better geometries. Exactly. So you so Loads of tire clearance. It makes one sense. I think the bit which is going to throw people is the word gravel, because really it isn't about the word gravel. That's just the name that's given to these kind of bikes. Mm. It's just a more general, multi-purpose bike, and therefore it makes sense for a lot of people. I see a lot of them as as winter road bikes up here as well, or just summer road bikes. What was it like um, sharing a bedroom with Nick? I've heard he is quite a prolific snorer. Do you, the most. I, I know Nick. You know this as well, Francis, don't you? I, it, worst night sleep of my life, <laughs> sleeping next to Nick. You know little, the film Little Nicky? And yes. when Little Nicky's asleep, he has that weird, like, snoring thing where he's, he's like... <laughs> like a demon is coming out of him. Yeah, yeah. Nick does that. He is a demon. So he falls asleep instantly, and then it's that until he wakes up. Yeah. And then the most annoying thing about Nick is there isn't a moment where he doesn't stop talking. And nearly in his sleep. He talks in his sleep as well. Oh, right. He snores or talks. It's one or the other. So whilst he's sleeping, he's making that noise. And then when he's awake, it's just constant chatty talking. So like he picked me up at 5 a.m. I was like, this is mint. I'm not driving for once. I'm going to get a couple of hours sleep. He talked at me about bearings for four (laughs) hours straight. (laughs) He on the really way to the bearings. show. He loves bearings. Oh, <laughs> he's a lovely guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have some housekeeping to do before we start this based on some mis- misinformation. Oh, from this last is my week. fault. <laughs> I'm we sorry, had a guys. lot of people comment and email us to tell us that prescription glasses are usually not made of glass. And I went home and I checked my glasses. And correct, they are not glass. Why are they called glasses then? Because they would have originally been made of glass. It's just a traditional term, isn't it? I'm from the past. Would you prefer them to be called, oh, where's my acrylics? I don't know if they're made of acrylic. plastic scissors. So what's what's the verdict? (laughs) The verdict is that glasses aren't made out of glass. And that's all I have on that. We were spreading misinformation. We were fake news. Yeah. We've got to be careful what we say here. First up, we're going to address some rumours. Since Francis posted his sponsored decathlon video, people have been asking what's going on with Scott Bikes. And they've rightly guessed we're not working with them anymore. So what's happened? I had a fight with Tony at the pub the other day. Is that unrelated to this or related? Well, no, he works for Scott. Yeah. That's why everything fell apart. Yeah, but you and him go out in Newcastle, get a bit leery, have a tear up with the lads. That's just standard though, isn't it? Yeah, that isn't the reason. <laughs> just normal normal 
Geordie behaviour. How long were you with Scott? Two years. It was two years. Yeah. So back when I was just me as a YouTuber making videos on my own, I had sponsors that blanket covered the whole year um, to support what the what the channel was doing. And so I had a bike and equipment as well. And it was great. And Scott, I signed with them two years ago. Yeah. And then everything kind of changed. You got involved, Emily got involved, and now the channel is very, very different from how it used to be. So we have switched to basically doing project-based sponsorship deals only um, in terms of bike. Yeah, so you essentially were a lifestyle vlogger. Um, then you wanted, you brought me in. So I started to do 2023 and Emily came six months after that when we wanted to start doing the podcast because Emily's actually got the skills to make a good podcast. Um, sorry that we're involved in Not it, Emily. Not today, but <laughs> She didn't usually. even press record on the camera. <laughs> So then we wanted to do more, or you wanted to do more produced videos, as we call them internally, which is like focusing on products, doing things like the versus videos and that kind of stuff. And therefore, it made sense having other people involved and different opinions, stuff to bounce off. Um, so the traditional relationship you have with bike sponsors just kind of doesn't fit the sort of things that we want to be doing anymore. So like, we ultimately want to be able to, like recycling channel, the number one thing that we care about is bikes and therefore have being restricted to one brand's bikes just isn't a very Riding good move. It. it was always a bit of a hybrid between you have what most people probably saw it as it's similar to an athlete. You're sponsored by a bike brand. You only really talk about that bike brand and you don't talk about anything else. Scott, however, were really cool about it. And when I, uh, first started chatting to him it was a guy called Thad who worked for um, Scott Global and I was like look I have this channel I want to be able to talk about other people's bikes I want to put them in the thumbnails that kind of thing and they were very accommodating and they pretty much let us talk about what we wanted anything we wanted to say we could put in any brand we could put in however for some reason it still felt like walking on eggshells a little bit and that's probably in my own head but that's just how it was Whereas the situation we're in now is just freedom. I guess what sealed it for you that it probably isn't the most appropriate thing was we knew we wanted to do more lower value stuff. And the starting point for that was you getting hold of an entry level bike from Scott. I bought it at trade price. Yeah. I bought it from my own sponsor. <laughs> which was an 899 pound speedster 50 i think which was the cheapest bike cheapest road bike that scott made what was the video that we did it was just like what does an entry level bike look like in 2023 yeah and people were not upset but it helped redefine what entry level is for us as well definitely um because it's you know it's nearly a thousand pounds it was spec'd in a particular way and there was a huge amount of comments which were saying decathlon are really good value bikes and really good bikes and we're like oh i haven't really thought about decathlon as a, as a competitive bike brand in this space you just assume that they're like a lot of the supermarket brands where they just kind of have a generic bike so we started looking into decathlon we you found one which you were like actually this could be make a really good video we they knew didn't even know we existed we went in, secret filmed, probably in their, sh in their shop. Blurred out people's faces. Probably shouldn't have, because I think you're technically not allowed to do that, but we did it anyway. Uh, <laughs> bought one of their bikes at full retail. We did a video on it, and it went absolutely bonkers, which cemented that there is loads of stuff in the bike industry that we should be talking about, and there are limitations about what we can and can't do. So we wanted to get rid of those limitations so we can talk more freely about stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a learning process, isn't it? Like we, we've been in cycling long enough or that we weren't looking at entry level bikes anymore yep. because we weren't entering the sport. Mm -hmm. um, so making videos like that, despite having a few negative comments on it, was a, it, it teaches you. Uh, and now look where we are. So. Wait, where, which one? The decathlon one? The original one. No, the, original the, one, the yeah. Scott one. Yeah. We still have a couple of channel level sponsors, but ultimately the goal for the channel level sponsors is that they don't impede us from being able to do stuff that we want to do so uh garmin as everyone knows uh are a channel level sponsor uh, and hopefully we stay working with them because they're great to work with and they allow us to do cool things 
Uh, Silka and Sturka are the only other two channel level sponsors that we have, which is absolutely wild considering when I started working with you, you had something like 15 channel sponsors. Mm -hmm. Like the list was humongous. And then I, before we started talking, doing this podcast, I was like, these are the only ones you got left. And you were just like, whoa. Yeah. That, well, like, it's, less, it's less admin though, isn't it? When, you, when, you're, when you're one person, you just get sponsored like an athlete does yeah, yeah. and go, look, I've got all these things I'm, that's, that are happening through the year. Your product's probably going to get featured in some of them. Pay me for the year and that's it. And, and there's enough money that I can live my life. Like it's security, yeah, 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 yeah. you know. For sure. Well, like, you have to think about it because it's not back back and forward emails all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, Cade Media has you to do that and to, I, I say, I want to go and do this trip. Is there an opportunity to get a sponsor specifically for that trip, and then you do all the work, figuring it out who's appropriate, mm -hmm. what's going to fit nicely, and then it just happens. There's a lot of just back and forth, isn't there? Mm. Can I talk about a trip, but not in detail because we haven't mentioned it. Have we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a trip coming up really soon. Yeah. Bike packing is back on the cards. Yeah. Uh, I banned it for last year because we had to, we essentially needed to rebrand what we're doing and let everyone understand that it's very different. Bike packing's back on the cards and the first trip is happening in a month's time. And mm -hmm. there, there's, there's, there's a USP with this trip that I've never seen in the bike packing space before, ever, from a content perspective. Um, and I'm not going to say what it is because I, it's amazing. And it was actually you, I think, that drove that. that I'm not idea. even going to mention it, as in it, when we do it. Yeah. I'll let it speak for itself. I'm very excited <laughs> for that trip. But Me ultimately, too. yeah, we've, we've still got a couple of channel sponsors, which we don't want to conflict with allowing us to do the videos that we want to do. Um, and a lot of the stuff going forward, if there are any sponsor or paid stuff, then it's just going to be like smaller project eBay stuff that still is, we are not going to compromise on what we want to do. Ultimately, our number one priority is our audience, the people that listen, the people that watch, and we don't want to do things that are just not appropriate for that. I think it, it makes things easier from my perspective to signpost when something's sponsored and when something's not. Because if it's not signposted as an audience at home, then it means it's not sponsored. Whereas before, it's kind of like, oh, you're sponsored for the year, so every time a tail fin is on my bike, do I have to be like, oh, by the way, they're sponsored the chat. Like, it's impossible to say that every single time. In the same way, like, I don't know, Mark Cavendish is sponsored by Villier at the moment. He doesn't say every single photo is like hashtag ad or this is this stuff. It's a it's a bit of a weird gray area in yeah. the advertising standards. Whereas now we can be like, if there's a sponsored thing which you have organised for a trip, then it'll be like, this is sponsored here. There you go. Yeah. It makes the signposting easier. And, and really, if there is some kind of sponsorship, it's because we've brokered something that we think is interesting. So, you know, like a bikepacking trip costs a lot of money. <laughs> and therefore, actually getting people involved means that... Depends where it is. It doesn't just come out of our pockets. Yeah, I think the main thing is it, it's always... I think that audiences are very, very wise to advertising these days. And I think the time of what people call lifestyle marketing, which is, you know, you pay an athlete to ride a bike and they don't have to say this product is great because then you just see them riding it all the time. I think that kind of thing is coming to an end a little bit. Number one, because it's it's a dodgy gray area in terms of advertising standards, but also people are very wise to advertising and they understand that there's potentially a deal going on there. Um, so I think that realistically we are all in a position where we still need sponsors to be able to make a living and to put out this kind of content for free, all of the content on the channel for us to be able to put out for free. We need to make sure that. Especially we're when it comes to trips. Yeah. Because, okay, use this as an example. We got, we cycle across America um, massively successful, raised loads of money for charity and the videos did great. We had a sponsor um, for that, Kamut. Thank you to Kamut for, for actually saying, yes, we're going to sponsor it. They put some money in. We still lost money. That It's so expensive. That trip cost, I think <laughs> it was about 25 grand. Yeah. People just don't realize how much stuff costs, but it, it, does. <laughs> it does. And that's, that's not like, oh yeah, we're staying in the Ritz. That's like crappy motels, uh, food every day. Cause you eat about seven times the amount of a normal human being. Um, 
having to fix stuff on the road and you just pay a premium for it. Even just like, flights. F- yeah, and the flights. Flights are thousands of pounds. Thousands of pounds. So I think we understand that. And with that in mind, we ultimately just want to be able to be as transparent as possible so that the audience watching can make a decision whether they want to, you know, they understand it's part of it is advertising and they can make a decision on that whether they want to continue to watch whether they don't and that's fine but it's kind of being clear about that Mm. that's the most important thing isn't it it is yeah and and, you know like i said like for me the only thing i actually care about is the people watching the videos and listening to us on uh, listening to the podcast so like i i'm always thinking about how do we get better value for those people and one of the ways is not needing them to spend money for us to exist so for example we we don't need them to click a link and buy a product for us to be able to make money we don't need them to buy anything that we're doing to our channel exactly yeah and and then the the next thing that we're going to start doing more this year which i am so keen for is i want people to be able to get our content for free and we're going to start giving stuff back as well so like one of the other things that we can do by having all these amazing relationships with brands is we can go, right, well, we want we want more product and we're just going to give it to people for free. We're just going to give our audience stuff and do competitions and give back in that way because, like, that's what we want. We want people watching it because they're entertained. They're, they're going to have a great time. They're going to gain something from it, from information or whatever, and where possible, some people are actually going to get some some cool stuff for absolutely now as well. So, yeah, audience, you guys, number one priority for me. Now for some news. So Shimano reported a 55% drop in profits for last year, and their sales were down 24%. So it turns out that the worldwide crank recall actually cost them 14.5 million pounds, which is about 8 million US dollars. Uh, But don't shed a tear for them, because what we also found out is that the company still posted a 322 million pound profit the year before which is 405 million US dollars. It's worth pointing out that these numbers relate to Shimano as a whole, not just the cycling division. Shimano is also predicting that there's going to be a decline in 2024, and they're expecting revenue for bike components to drop 11%, with an 18% fall in sales due to high inventory levels. Inventory? Oh, for God's sake. (laughs) Is it reputational damage, or is it just in line with the industry? It's in line with the industry. It is, 100%. I think not that much, like yeah the reputation of the the sports products that they're making like the the racing products we see that and we're talking about it all the time and everyone we know knows what Altegra is but on at the most most of the stuff they sell is your stuff on the Halfords bikes cheaper decathlon bikes the commuters most of the stuff they sell isn't bike products no we're fishing isn't it yeah is that Shimano is that just Shimano as a whole then I think so yes I think a lot of Shimano's cycling business is OEM, so selling to manufacturers yeah. rather than selling uh, to consumers. Um, and that just isn't really going to change, is it? They're, they're massive, and £4.5 million pounds to them as, a, as the cost of a crank recall is insignificant to their scale. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a lot, does it? Not really, Those no. figures. Um, the stuff they sell is cycling components, fishing tackle, rowing equipment, golf supplies. Oh, no, they stopped golf supplies in 2015. Yep, those things. <laughs> <laughs> that is some weird stuff you don't expect. It's like Garmin do um, boat motors and sound systems. Do they? Or do yep. they yep. do boat GPS? No, they do boats, motors, and sound systems. Motors? I'm pretty sure. We're going to find out in a minute because Emily's typing I, furiously. I don't think they do. I think they've got a boat in the um, in their office to highlight that they do the like GPS thing, which goes on the roof, and then like all of the navigation and tracking stuff. I think it's all nav and tracking. I have the answer. Uh, they do do a boat motor. They do. Yeah, wow. horse trolling motor. I've se- I I thought I'd seen one in a box. In the warehouse. Do you mean like a motor is in like the sort of thing that goes off the back of a speedboat? Yeah, boat? you put it in the back of it, yeah. Because we've talked about Garmin motors, do we have to signpost that this is sponsored? This is a sponsored <laughs> segment of the video. They are not paying us to talk about their, their boat motors. If you well, want to buy a boat motor, you get 5% off in the description down below. I'm lost where we are. <laughs> where are we? Uh, before we wrap up the news section, we want to briefly mention a recall that's going on currently with some e-bike batteries. Do I say batteries weird as well? Batteries. The story was sent to us by listener Nick. 
There's currently a recall on UPP batteries. They've been linked to reports of explosions which have caused house fires. And the UK's regulatory body are now classing this as a dangerous product. And the London Fire Brigade is asking e-bike users to check their batteries and stop using UPP ones immediately. So if you do have an e-bike or any e kind of product, check your batteries. And if they're UPP, maybe don't use them. What's a UPP battery? I don't know, but I think, I'm assuming if you've got an e-bike, you can look at it and it'll say. Your e-bike is in my garage. Is my house going to burn down? I don't actually know. You should check the battery on it. Uh, okay. Although the battery is actually in a custom-made 3D case. So you, yeah. So I, I don't really know. The I probably can't check it. I'll just, it'll be fine. <laughs> I'll be fine. No, no, no. Check the battery, please. <laughs> don't go, ah, it'll be fine. I've never had this happen with a battery, but... This has happened twice to me with two different pairs of straighteners. They're turned off, mm. but they're still plugged in at the wall and turned on at the wall. And thankfully, both times I have been in the room when this happens, but the cable just spontaneously combusts, sparks, sparks, sparks. And just like if, if it was touching anything would have caused a fire. That has happened twice to me. What? With two different, one was GHG and one was Remington. And I, the Remington ones- They're a legit brand. I just rebought the same Remington ones because they're really good straighteners. But I now have a special system to make sure it is plugged off, at, turned off at the wall. I had a phone charger explode, explode next to my head. Did you? When I was asleep. This, this is a saga. I took it. <laughs> so I bought a phone charger off Amazon, went bike packing with you. Your little pot of pesto leaked into my pannier on the charger. Yes. And it was covered in like oily pesto. Uh. And then I was like, oh, I just like cleaned it off and it was fine. Two days later, it goes Poof, in the middle of the night. It's like sparks, smoking. The whole room smells of smoke. It was fine. It didn't like set fire to anything. Did you smell the pesto though? Did it smell quite nice? I was like, <laughs> what? The like, it, <laughs> was it the pesto? I ended up look, seeing if I could get it re replaced because I'm cheap, just on Amazon. <laughs> and I sent it back to, to through the Amazon thing to Samsung because it was Samsung charger. They then responded very quickly. It was a fake charger. So was it because it was fake or was it because of the pesto? We will never know. Well, but weirdly enough, they then both. sent it back to me. What the broker? I think they legally have to. Yeah, the bro the, the original charger, the fake, and it was fake. And then the listing on Amazon uh, got removed, and I got an email from Amazon saying, "Like, really sorry about this." They gave me a full refund, and it was a fake listing because there's a lot of fake products. Yeah, just yeah, they're listed on Amazon. I don't use Amazon anywhere near as much as I used to. For, for reasons like that, if if I if I want to buy something Pesto. electrical or I bought some new aftershave and you can get it on Amazon for cheaper and I d I'm not sure it's real, so I bought it from a source that I know is yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. Now on to our big question: What are your unpopular road cycling opinions? This one is inspired by a question Wiggle asked its followers on Instagram this week, and there's lots of debate in the comments. So I'm going to read out some of these comments, and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree. First one is high-end aluminium trumps low-end carbon. I I used to ride race a Cervelo S1, which I guess would be considered high-end aluminium, and it was awesome, and I regret ever getting rid of it, but it's really harsh. So I think if you want like a, a nice bike to ride around most of the time and not just race crits on it, just get a carbon one because you'd be hard-pressed to find a bad carbon frame these days. New. So my first thoughts is I don't really see what high-end aluminium is compared to low-end aluminium. I can see an expensive bike versus a not expensive bike, but surely it's all the same. It's, it's aluminium. How it's um, it butted, isn't it? It's how the tubes are formed and how they're... I don't think there is such a thing as high-end aluminium. I think there's just expensive aluminium bikes and cheap ones. You know, they're within reason, of course, there's going to be like, I'm sure you could make a bike where it's basically made of paper, but I don't think that really happens. It's interesting. Ultimately, what I'm getting at is the opposite of what you're saying about carbon, because I would assume that a really cheap car carbon bike would be junk, whereas you, you think that actually everything is just good now. Um, carbon stuff, yeah, I think it's got to a point where it is extremely good, even I at the lower end. Whereas back in the day, do you remember when you bought like Planet X frames and stuff and they were just flexy and all over the place? Whereas the cheap carbon yeah. frames now are actually pretty decent. I, I was actually talking to some people at Core Bike about this kind of idea that generally speaking, 
everything is good now. It's the same with tech. F- cheap phones are good. There's stuff that has merit over other stuff, mm-hmm. but the minimum standard of most things these days is pretty good, isn't mm-hmm. it? But then would you also apply that to some AliExpress stuff that's been purchased? Like there was those carbon wheels that um, a guy contacted you, sent them in, and we talked about, and they are Q- actually... That's a imp- QC issue, though, isn't it? Rather than the product actually yeah. being bad. Q- QC and warranty. So actually, that's that's where stuff is good or bad now, though, and isn't it? Mm-hmm. Same as you, I've ridden loads of aluminium bikes. I think they're mint. But they do tend to ride pretty similar. Yeah. You get lighter... It's all about thickness of the, the tubes, isn't it? And like that's what you're paying for, better. Something that's just constructed slightly better. I don't think there's that much difference between aluminium and carbon anymore, to be honest. You know, arguably aluminium's a bit harsher or whatever, but a good bike's a good bike. Next one is aesthetic is important. It's important to some people. The, where I agree with this is if you look at your bike and you go, oh, yeah, that is mint, you you want to ride it more. Yes, what I don't think is important is having white shoes and white socks and white helmet and white glasses. I don't think that is that doesn't make me enjoy riding anymore. Helmet and glasses, no, but definitely white shoes and white socks because I can see them. Then I go, oh, yeah, they look cool. And then I ride faster. So I agree with it if that inspires you to enjoy riding more. Mm. But don't put that on other people. Yes. Next one is you shouldn't wear protein kit the yellow jersey, the polka dot jersey ever. I massively disagree. Nah, I disagree. I think you should wear whatever the hell you want to wear. There's a weird um, culture around that, isn't there? Hmm. Back when I started racing, it'd be like, oh, you know, only only newbies would wear pro kit. Where, and, but whereas in football, it's like the done thing, isn't it? If hmm. you're a supporter, you wear the jersey. And it's just a nicer culture, isn't it? So it's, I like that bit of football. Black cycling gear is meh. Bring on the bright colors i neither agree or disagree with this because sometimes i wear all black sometimes i wear lots of bright colors yeah it just depends on my mood really i i'm so i just can't be bothered choosing kit or clothes so i always just wear the same thing so i've got like five of the same t-shirt mm. and it's the same with kit i just go oh, i'll just choose black it's easier it's okay not to wear lycra correct agree i don't really have anything more to add to that wear whatever the hell you want an hour on amazing roads is better than three on average roads an hour on average roads is better than three on average roads (laughs) (laughs) why would i ever want to cycle longer than an hour (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's that's easy to agree i think i do i do like a long ride sometimes especially when you're going from point to point but but i I don't think i love an hour this isn't about duration though this is about the road quality Mm. so it's ultimately saying if you've got those like beautiful buttery smooth roads where it's it's like undulating and a bit weavy and you just it just rides real amazing doing that for an hour is better than doing more on something that's just it's normal yes yeah i agree mm. I'm, I'm always going to agree with that but i also do agree with one hour is better than three <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but like even if, if it's like you're going to ride five hours this week i would rather do five, five times one one hour rides. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Rim brakes are still a good option. Um, I love rim brakes. I think they are amazing. I think they are good in most scenarios. However, I think they are not a good option because less manufacturers are making things... As time goes on, they're going to become harder and harder to access and buy. I have been riding a leftover from our Scott sponsorship, a rim brake addict with carbon wheels, and the brakes are crap. And it's not the brakes, it's the braking surface of the wheels. Yep. Back when I used to do loads of training in winter on rim brake bikes, because that's what we had in 2010, we always had alloy braking surfaces, and that just makes the world of difference. Yeah. Where as soon as you put carbon wheel, it's, it's crap. The, Rob, the carbon guy, carbon repair man, is stands by... That braking surfaces shouldn't be made of carbon fiber. I, the, I, I, I had forgotten how bad they were. They just don't, st- they, there's a lag. Even in the dry, they just take a second to kick in. And uh, if you've been spoiled by disc brakes, then it's kind of like, oh, but. Me and Jimmy did a bike packing trip into Wales. Jimmy had a tail fin on the back that was carrying about 20 kilograms of stuff. It was so much stuff. It was full of like 
film. We did like sit down documentary style video at, uh, at the place we stayed on the bikepacking trip mm. with AJ and Chris Hall. So I had like two cameras, tripods, Malt three tripods, a uh, laptop. Like it was, it was like it was full so on production bottom setup. heavy. It was unreal. But that bike was, it was like an LA sprint <laughs> yeah, race bike with bit. with rim brakes and carbon wheels. Oh, really? And we were going down these hills in Wales, 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 in Wales, and you could smell the fire coming from those brake pads. Mm. It was insane, wasn't it? I quite like that smell. It reminds me of bunch racing back at that sort of time as well <laughs> you just go down a descent it's like oh that stinks yeah that was fun mm. to be fair the rims were fine but um, let me caveat all of that by saying alloy rim brakes stop in- incredibly well so are rim brakes still a good option yeah yeah i think they are it, it keeps bikes cheap and if you just want a bike for pootling around it might be harder to upgrade but maybe not there's a lot of secondhand stuff around next we have there are a lot of terrible slash dangerous car drivers out there, but there are, in brackets, nearly as many terrible, dangerous road cyclists. Agree or disagree? That is an unpopular opinion. <laughs> there are nearly as many terrible... Well, there are nowhere near as many terrible, dangerous road cyclists. I think cars are inherently way more dangerous. Well, there's just way more of them. Just statistically, yep. there's far more car drivers. Yeah. And because of that, there are far more dangerous drivers. On top of that... If a dangerous, a, a dangerous, terrible cyclist doesn't kill people, a car driver does. Well, cyclists do kill people, but the number is very, very low. Yes, very, very low. The, I guess, I guess, it depends what you define as dangerous as well, isn't it? Like if you're on a bicycle swinging around all over the road, you're not likely to cause significant damage to everything. If you're in a car at even equivalent speed, swinging around all over the road. If you did have an incident with something, you're more likely to cause significant damage. Yeah, cars are just, cars are more abundant and inherently way more dangerous. Five five people a day are killed on British roads by motor vehicles. Killed? Killed. Five a day. Really? Yeah. We did this in our road safety week, didn't we? That's wild. Yeah, on average, five people a day are killed on roads. We whereas, did this, yes. Whereas by cyclists, it's, it's one over the last five years or something, or two. Good statistics, guys. And thank you for checking it, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> checking everything today on my name. I do sometimes make stuff up. <laughs> Roadies won't acknowledge any other cyclist if they're not in Lycra. That's not true. I disagree. I think it's more about the person. Some people don't acknowledge people, whether they're in Lycra or not. And some people acknowledge lots of people. I even wave at cars. <laughs> I wave at everyone I'm out riding. I, if I see a dog, I'll, I'll stop and give him a little tickle. I'm not in a rush. I'm on I a say hello time. to everybody. Yeah. I'm usually dressed as a roadie, so maybe that's why I get people roadies wave back because I'm dressed as a roadie. But maybe they wouldn't if I wasn't dressed as a roadie. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. We also live in a very, very friendly part of the world. Mm. There is, and I think that in America, it's the opposite. I think the South is more friendly and the North is less. Correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> American people. But in the UK, the North is known as being more friendly than the South. And we both have experience of living in both places, If especially off-road. If you were walking, if you were cycling, someone comes in the other direction, you say hello. If you go to London, that does not happen. But you walk past a lot more people well, that's as well. The yeah, thing, that's isn't why. It? Yeah, you just, you get in a you mindset. You think that, but I, I, in America, in New, New York, they're known for not being friendly, but it's still significantly more, more friendly, friendly than, than London. Here, like people still get have to start chatting to you just Agreed. randomly. And that happens. LA, loads. But it is more chilled. It is not as uh, densely populated, for sure. So you go, for, I go for a run or a ride, and I nearly say hello to every single person I yeah. sort of see. Um, unless it's like a real busy hotspot, like a little high street or something. I don't know. I just think some people have their own stuff going on inside their own head. And if they don't say hello to you, it's not necessarily a reflection on them or you. Just I agree. Yeah. You shouldn't have to. No. Yeah. Yeah. If if someone doesn't wave back, that doesn't mean they're a horrible person. Maybe they're having a like just thinking about something. Right. Uh, so no one cares about your bike except you. In nearly all cases, I agree with it. The only exception is if you happen to have a, a absolutely bonkers, unique, amazing bike. In which case, some people do care about it. Like a tool bike or a penny farthing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> if you had a penny farthing, people are gonna go, "What? What's that like to ride? Horrible." Yeah. Oh, you okay, seen Jeremy Vine rides one around London. 
Is he? Like a full-size penny farthing. Yeah. He gets a lot of hate from the uh, taxi drivers and stuff on Twitter. Excluding the anomalies, I agree. No one cares about your bike. Uh, you need to strength train. I disagree. You don't need to do anything. You don't. You don't need to do it. You may benefit from it. You'll benefit more from mobility training, which everyone probably should do. But you don't need strength training. But you probably should do it. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Do we have our own unpopular opinions that I we do. can add to this? Go on then. I do. Uh, <laughs> road cycling is dead. <laughs> That's unpopular. <laughs> oh, I, road cycling will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah, untrue and will never be true. Well, I, I what? So where? I, so this isn't actually my opinion. This is my this is my analysis of what I am seeing in the industry. As you've mentioned earlier, there's at least one bike brand which are saying they're selling more gravel bikes. A lot of the new products which are coming out are looking like they're more geared towards the gravel space, the adventure space. Uh, I think what that means is over time, we are going to see less pro bikes or they will represent a bike rather than a whole drop down. And then you're going to get an all road bike, which is actually a gravel bike, but can also be a road bike. So that is why I think road is dead i don't think people are going to stop riding on roads and i don't think people are going to stop riding on slick tires because i'm going to do that forever because that's enjoyable uh but i think road as a term or a classification or category of bike i think might be dead for for the audio only listeners jimmy is putting road oh sorry dead in inverted commas every time he says it yeah <laughs> uh so you're both you both disagree with that i think you have to just because you've gone to a shore and you've seen lots of gravel products, you have to work out that that's just showing the new stuff. So what that is showing is that the gravel uh, placement in their offering is expanding. Does it outweigh road stuff? I imagine the answer is still no. I imagine they've still got a thousand different road products available. So they're expanding their gravel stuff. Is it outweighing their road stuff? I would say at this point. Probably not, but I don't Why are you know. doing a little smiley face? I know, he's, what are you about to say? You've got, got some witty comeback. No, I, no, I just, my, I, you know I'm very good at absorbing trends. Yes, you are. And I am really confident in the next five years, these brands are not going to be making road products. They're going to be making gravel and adventure products that can be used on a road. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because we've talked about this before, as in, Trickle down from pros doesn't make sense. Most people are not racers. They don't need the fast performance type stuff and it's way more uncomfortable. Bikes for normal people, in, in, in commas, is much more... It makes much more sense, mm -hmm. doesn't it? So, so I guess that so makes sense why it would be an expanding market. An example, if you look at a road bike on a display stand from a brand these days, it will probably have 32 mil tires on it. Yeah. Which pros are not using. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at what tire sizes manufacturers are now making, nearly everything is 30 to 50 mil tires. What's the end game? Are we all going to end up on mountain bikes? No, no, I don't think we are. I think, <laughs> we're going, I think we'll end up on relaxed geometry bikes with massive tire clearance, and that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have massive tires on it, and they are going to be disc brakes. Versatile. I've got one. Yep. Base layers are a lie. You you just sold to you by you, a big base layer. You hate base layers. So I hate much, base layers. So much, yeah. <laughs> I, I in some respects I agree. They do make you warmer because it's an extra layer of fabric. Yes. No matter what people say about wicking and all of this kind of stuff, it's it's an extra. It's it's going to make you a bit warmer. It just is. Um, something you won't appreciate as someone which has never been other than lean is. What the reason I like a base layer is it just makes me feel more confident and better about wearing lycra. Having a base layer on just makes me feel a bit more like held in and tighter and and that is something which makes me feel better when I ride a bike. That is a fair reason. But I do know it makes me also a little bit warmer. The reason I never like wearing one is because to take it off, if you get too hot, to take it off, it's a palaver. You gotta take your jersey off and then take it. Whereas if you wear a gilet, you just take it off, like layers on top of a jersey, you just remove. Last one, 
FTP is overrated as a metric. That is an unpopular cycling opinion. Elaborate. Well, everyone uses FTP because it's an easy thing to measure and an easy, easy thing to test. We are, well, I am guilty of using it because it's easy to use for videos. So like we did the Garmin 30 day challenge and the test was FTP at the start, FTP at the end. But in terms of how good you are at cycling, how fast you are at cycling, there are plenty of riders. James Jobber, for example, he's Conti rider. He has pretty low FTP whoa, compared whoa, whoa, whoa. to a lot of, okay, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Com <laughs> compared to a lot of bike races at his level, yes. he has a low FTP, yeah. but he has an incredible lactate recovery. So he can do five minute effort, the three minutes, five minute efforts and recover in between, which makes him an extremely good bike racer, yeah. much better than I ever was, despite my FTP, watts per kilo wise being significantly better than his. If it was all just based on FTP and what a lot of people have on that, you know, like their Zwift FTP is what category you get put in in the races, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but in real life racing, it's just not the case. Yeah, I, I agree. It is, it's But it's easy to test. Well, I, I kind of think of it, it's like weighing yourself. And the, actual, the important thing with weighing yourself is that you do it on the same scales mm -hmm. because every or scales are different. So for example, the 30 day video that you did, you did the same FTP test at the beginning as the end. And therefore it's, it's just a benchmark for that isolated thing. Mm -hmm. Has my performance improved? Yes, because I've done the same test twice. But if you're using that FTP test as the benchmark for everything that you do and uh, as a marker of how fit you are, it just isn't appropriate in my opinion. Yep. Tell us some of your unpopular opinions, stick them in the comments on YouTube or email us at wildonespodcast at cavemedia.co.uk. Time for another round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to read out a list of things and you are going to tell me if they are overrated or underrated. First up, a cheese board at the end of a meal. <laughs> overrated. Who I like? You're going to say, I've seen you. Oh. Do you remember we were in Spain bike packing? <laughs> I think that's why I was ill. Yeah, I think this is why you were saying they're overrated. Uh, we but were in Spain. Three days into a bike touring four trip, days. four days in, yeah, day four. we were making good progress. Everything was great. And then we ended up in a town where there was very limited options for food. The options were curry place or Spanish wine bar. Wine bar, yeah. That, that did like some hors d'oeuvres. Yeah. And the, one of them was cheese, cheese board. Yeah. So that's what we got for the table amongst some like bread and olives and nice things. I didn't like the look of the cheese. I mean, a baby bell is about my limit of fanciness for cheese. Jimmy, <laughs> the, the cheese board was in front of us. There is one cheese in particular that looks so gnarly. It's, it was like brown with proper blue mold all the way yeah. through it. And we both, Stunk. being English, we're trying to be polite and Not we didn't English. want like the chef to <laughs> be really upset. Jimmy was like, I'll take one for the team. And he ate the cheese. That I, I, don't, I actually, did, there was another cheese as well that was like a hard one that like reeked I as well. I, I should have gone to the curry it place. Was, it was so unpleasant. I'm not a cheese, no way. No, I just don't. No, not, it was not incredibly me. unpleasant and I don't like cheeses like that. I'm like, cheddar please, thank you very much. You got so ill mm -hmm. about three or four hours later that we ended up spending four days in the hotel in whatever town that was. Yeah. And I've never seen you so ill and upset and sad. Yeah, that was that was terrible. And that's why Jimmy thinks cheese boards are overrated. I just think that, like, who wants to eat cheese after a meal? I want to have another glass of wine and I want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that was actually a, a very key Atticus moment for me on why I was ready to no longer do Atticus. After many hours of my body deciding to remove everything that was inside it, I remember being laying on the floor editing fo Atticus photos from a photo shoot that Emily and Daisy had done in the, uh, at the studio in England so that they could then go out on a mailer later that day. So I was and you had to do it. Yeah. You had to do it. Yeah. I was in an absolute wreck on the floor editing photos going like, what? Atticus is a kit brand that Jimmy and Emily used to run for people and at home. I'm texting him going, are they done yet? What's holding you up? <laughs> I and he said being sick on the floor. I did, literally, I remember being like half propped up on the floor on top of like some towels, probably naked because I was just getting rid of everything. Just going, oh, what, have, what has my life become? <laughs> and it was all that cheese, that little bit of cheese. Yeah. So yeah, cheese boards, overrated, hate them. 
that shouldn't come at the end of a meal. The only meal where you're having a cheese board is like a multiple coursed meals, in which case you're full, aren't you? If if you want to class Quite pizza heavy. as a cheese board, I'm all in. <laughs> Technically it is. <laughs> it's a board with cheese on top. Love it. <laughs> uh, next one is pet ownership. So I saw a tweet this week that said, being a pet owner is like being a sugar daddy. You waste all of your money on keeping them happy, and the only thing that they do is look cute and give you attention sometimes. <laughs> That's class. Uh, yes, yes, this, that is very, yes. It's true, but there's not a problem with that, is there? No, there's not a problem with it. It's fine. We, we're currently all staring at a beautiful puppy that sat in between us, our Aww. dog Bella, who always comes to work. I've never had a pet. I enjoy other people's pets. Yeah. Bella's company is amazing. However, I know... It is sometimes a full-time job, a pain in the ass for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem with ours is she doesn't like to not be with us, but she's getting better at that. Isn't she? We leave her at home more and she's not screaming her head off. So she's being good girl, but good Bella. What's the question then? Are pets overrated is or pet under? ownership overrated? No, no absolutely it's not. not. No, I no. get, I get like, although yeah, it is a pain. Sometimes I get way more satisfaction and reward out of it. I would like a pet turtle. Is that hard work? I've watched some on the internet before. They like they're surprisingly fast. Are they? Yeah. I don't think you want a turtle, do you? Do you want a tortoise? tortoise. A little one or a massive one? Okay, wait. So it depends what country you're in. Oh, does it? Yeah. They, uh, I because <laughs> I was cycling through the desert in Death Valley, and we'd stopped by the side of the road, and a man drove up in his car. He was high, so high. And he, he goes, have you seen the turtles? And then we were all laughing about it afterwards because we're like, turtles, doesn't he know that they're in the sea? And then it turns out that in America, often it's just like a blanket term for a tortoise could be a turtle. And they're in like the desert. So you did see some? Yeah. In the desert? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen a few. Garmin Unbound as well. There's often uh, tortoises or turtles there. Which um, one is it? I don't know, but I snapping, snapping ones. <laughs> Oh, the like the gnarly ones. It, you, I, I went to say hello to it. I was going to like, I don't know what I was going to do, but it went, Whoa! went for me. Scary. I always wanted a terrapin when I was little. Oh, Which terrapin. That's, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. They're the little ones, aren't they? They're yeah. very small. They? Yeah, yeah. But my mum would never let me get one because she said that they had carried salmonella. Uh, wait, I don't know if that was a lie to <laughs> not have one, but I was always, then I was scared of them. Uh, do they not also live till they're like 500? <laughs> I don't know. Do you want me to do some research? Get bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, just keep growing. No, that's a tortoise. But a terrapin doesn't. I remember when I was young, everyone wanted terrapins and then they everyone just ended up like flushing them down toilets <gasps> and like throwing what? them in lakes and stuff. No. So like there's a there's a park in Cardiff called Rose Park Lake. Full it, of terrapins. But it became the place where everyone used to just dump their their turtles and terrapins and things. Mm. So if so even now, if you go there now, there's you if you if you look close enough, there's just like little things. It's the same as like London parks are full of those parakeets, aren't they? Because people let them go. Is that why? Yeah, I think so. Fact or speculation? No, no, no that's true. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. P people shouldn't be abandoning animals like that, but I guess it's kind of cool that there's interesting animals places. Mm. Racing strangers on commutes, they don't know you're racing. <laughs> it's not racing then, is it? What's well, a time trial, I guess. I was definitely guilty of this when we lived in London. Just helps you get home sometimes. <laughs> North Bank World Champs. Yeah. Yeah. My my commutes in London were like full on interval sessions. And it wouldn't it wouldn't be racing commutes, but it might be like oh, I definitely used to race in between traffic lights. So it's like going down to Brixton, mm. there's just traffic lights. All of all the way, and you're always going to get caught on them. So it was just like, well, there's my interval. Just bash it to the next set of traffic lights. Or sometimes you see someone that's like 100 meters up the road, and you go, well, there's my target. So you're kind of racing them, but you're not really. It's just an excuse to put some weather. Yeah, in. harmless fun. Yeah, but what you don't do is catch them, pull in front of them, and then slow down. That's annoying. <laughs> That's overrated. Keep sending in your suggestions to wildonespodcast.cademedia.co.uk and we might read yours out in the next show. Next up is Fluff Up of the Week. Fluff up of the week. Over to you, Emily. Someone has installed a doorbell somewhere in one of the surrounding offices and it's the same doorbell that we have and for that reason, Bella keeps barking. If you tuned into last week's podcast, usually I cut them out in the edit slick as hell. So you never hear them. <laughs> but uh, Jimmy was talking at the time and we didn't redo it. So you hear one of Bella's barks last week. 
which I usually signpost by flashing up her. Oh, that 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 battery's about go. <laughs> <laughs> Finish what you're saying. Sorry. <laughs> oh, a piece of candy. Oh, a piece of candy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a dog with a fluffy tail. <laughs> um, yeah. So if last week you heard a bark, I apologise that it wasn't cut out. And if this week you hear a bark, then I also apologise. But it is what it is. Bella is just doing her job. We still think that pet ownership is underrated. <laughs> She's defending you. She's protecting us from the postman who he might stab us. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I guess people watching it, it doesn't really affect because you throw a little funny graphic on screen, but people listening to it don't get the funny little graphic. So it's like, what the hell was that? Yeah, they just get a buh in their ears every so often. Mm. We're going to change the battery. Yes. <laughs> Can I go for a week? Yeah, yeah, me too. A few minutes later. Let's head over to your emails because it's time for Listener's Takeover. I'm trying to work on my radio DJ voice. Actually, because it's just croaky. Uh, this one's from Roth. Roth? <laughs> <laughs> just like a pro radio DJ. <laughs> <laughs> this one's from Ruth who says, Hi, wild ones. Love your podcast and all your bike trips, Francis. My husband and I just retired and we are taking a very long trip across the States on our bikes. I can't decide whether or not to film our trip. One moment, I am all for bringing a video camera like the DJI. The next moment, I think, should I bother? I'm highly unlikely to start a YouTube channel of our trips, so I'm not sure if it's worthwhile. On the other hand, family and friends are keen for us to document our adventure. I guess if I have it, at least I can film the trip, but is it an in indulgence that will only take up space? I would love your thoughts. Thanks again for another great podcast. Warmest regards, Ruth. Hmm. Well, who has experience of filming trips across the USA? I assume Ruth is not going to try and film a video every single day, which would be difficult and a nightmare for someone who hasn't done a thousand of them before. But if you're going to just take a few clips during the trip, the DJI doesn't take up much space. Or even better, if you've got an iPhone, just use your iPhone because the quality of those is better than an action camera now. Yeah, I think I think my... My gut instinct is, again, as someone that's like documented lots of cycling stuff, making a video of a trip that isn't just going to be so rubbish that it's pointless ever looking at it again is a lot of work and a lot of skill. But taking photos is easy. My gut is document it in photo rather than video and still use an iPhone. Still use an iPhone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have things to look back on, but perhaps it taking photos is going to be a lot easier way to do it or just kind of a selfie to the camera like, oh, we're here doing this and this, and then there's a couple of shots. I guess your family and friends probably aren't expecting a two-hour feature-length film, but if if you're filming stuff in a way that it's going to detract from your trip, if you're having to stop and place your stuff, place your camera on your bike and get the perfect shot and then watch it back and da 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 I would say all that's going to do is detract from you being in the moment and enjoying your trip yeah th I definitely agree with that because I've been on trips or I've, I've just done things on bikes and my entire memory of it is through an LCD screen and like you, you don't end up actually appreciating what's going on because you're because you're looking for like oh that that's a good frame there that'll make a good photo rather than like oh actually where I am is lovely and you stop looking around at all the nice things because you're just looking for the next shot and the next bit of the story. Uh, I, If I was going to do something for me that was for my enjoyment, I would never document it. I would probably take a couple of photos because I enjoy personal photography, um, but I would definitely not make anything that was proper off the back of it. That is work as far as I'm concerned. And the amount of effort and energy I'd have to put into that for it to be a product that or a quality that I liked, even if it was just for me, would detract from the whole point of doing it in the first place. Yeah, because the other the other potential issue is you then you record everything and you come back with hours and hours and hours of footage. If this is a long trip, what are you going to do with it then? It's just it's going to be a mountain of work to get it done. You know, if this is something that you enjoy doing, but I, I don't know, everything kind of points to the fact that. It's maybe an unfamiliar thing and you're trying it for the first time. If you want to know what it's like, go out for a ride or go out for a ride on a Saturday, go out for a ride on a Sunday and try and film it and tell a story and work out what you're going to do with it. But I think it's a lot of work. 
listen, if your family and friends want an adventure, they can do their own holiday, I would say. But they're also <laughs> surely going to be happy seeing a couple of pictures of you having fun. I would say take a photo and you'll look at it back in a year and it will trigger a memory of really good times. Take a couple of selfie videos and... I don't know, start a little Instagram page for them or something like that. But don't don't make loads of work for yourself. Just enjoy your trip. I agree. Mm. Having said all of that, I do want to comment on the DJI being this big. It's not going to take up much space. Yeah, no. It's going to take up brain space is what it's going to take. Yeah, it'll take up brain space. I wouldn't worry about if you're um, scrutinizing over a thing that big. Yeah. Uh, it indicates to me that you might not realize how big and heavy your bike's going to end up being because that doesn't make any difference at all. Does it require cables and stuff to charge it? I don't know how it works. No, it's a USB thing. Right. That is a cable. It's a cable, yes. <laughs> you need a cable. <laughs> you probably got one for your phone already. Yeah, yeah. Have fun on your trip. Yeah, have an amazing time. Oh, we're finished. That's it. We finished the show. <laughs> so that's all for this week. Thank you for listening. Keep sending in your emails to wildonespodcast at cavemedia.co.uk. We do get a lot and we aren't always able to reply individually, but we do love to read them out. That's all for this week. And if you're listening, like the podcast, please leave us a five-star review. If you're watching, leave us a like and remember to subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode. Thank you very much. See you next week.